If recent times have taught us anything about community and culture, it is the importance of going to actual places and having tangible experiences with the world around us. Art museums and cultural sites, as well as more leisurely destinations, have tried to mitigate this need during quarantine by offering virtual tours and live streaming events. We can even live vicariously through penguins. However, once it's safe, many people will once again flock to galleries, museums, and sculpture gardens. Though it's likely many more people will flock to places like this, theme parks and amusement parks. From the small town operations to sprawling magical resorts. So why do we consider these two categories inherently separate? Can a profound art experience be found in themed entertainment? And what changes when we start considering these places less corporate fun and more art pieces? This is the case for theme parks. The concept of an immersive themed environment long predates the opening of Disneyland on July 17, 1955. Pleasure fairs go back to the medieval period. Communities would come together to dance, eat, and see new things in menageries, morality plays, and even early freak shows. And while this is an important strand in the DNA of theme park history, it's also important to look at early examples of artistically themed environments. As early as the 15th century, European nobility built hermitages in their gardens. There were cabins, huts, temples, water mills, decorated with books and skulls to look as if a humble hermit had just left for a stroll. Throughout Georgian England, men were hired to dress as druids and live as hermits on these estates, entertaining guests and espousing ruminations on solitude. And when flesh and blood hermits weren't available, lords and ladies would make one out of mannequins or moving automatons. Marie Antoinette had a model of an entire provincial village built into the gardens of Versailles, where she would take her friends and act out their country milkmaid fantasies. Pleasure gardens on European estates built fantastic worlds so their owners and visitors could visit philosophical concepts in physical form. Sacro Basco is a Mannerist sculpture garden in Bomarzo, Italy, built after the death of the Count's wife as a treatise on grief. There was dining in a hellmouth, a leaning tower similar to 20th century gravity houses, and a small amphitheater called the Theater of Nature. But these spaces were not meant to be widely accessible, available only to their owners and their guests. They required large amounts of land and resources not meant for a functional purpose, so themed environments remained the exclusive playgrounds of the rich elite. There were urban pleasure gardens around the 17th century, perhaps the first combination of the private garden follies and the medieval pleasure fairs. One of the first to open to the public was London's Vauxhall Gardens circa 1661. In addition to gardens, gazebos, and water features, there were concerts, fireworks shows, and battlefield reenactments. But it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that themed entertainment and attractions boomed for the common man. City parks provided a pleasant place for factory workers to enjoy on their lunch break. World's fairs and expositions provided large prestigious venues for nations to show off their cultural and technological contributions, including some of the first mechanical amusement rides. It was also a venue for nations to show off their contributions to colonialism and marginalization. But the expositions were a place where creative expression, national identity, and technological innovation came together as one experience. Railroad and cable car companies would take those innovations to build trolley parks, amusement parks at the end of a rail line functioning as an incentive for the population to take those rail lines on the weekend, often as a complement to nearby beaches. This is where the experience of amusements innovated beyond simple thrills. Dark rides and dioramas were introduced into the park landscape, innovating narrative and thematic depth in the ride experience. This emphasis on theming would be expanded to entire parks by the mid-20th century. A theme park boom would follow the post-war economic boom, with notable early theme park adopters of Santa Claus Land in Santa Claus, Indiana, Knott's Berry Farm in Buena Park, California, and Corriganville Movie Ranch in Simi Valley, California, with the trend reaching its creative zenith through the opening of Disneyland in 1955. The unique draw of Walt Disney's park was not that it was the first or most thrilling, but that the Imagineers synthesized popular themes with innovative social engineering and expressed them using the same meticulous vigor as they had on films previously. And this has been the prevailing philosophy into theme design today. From expansive lands like Galaxy's Edge and Pandora, to small independent theme spaces like escape rooms and modern themed bars. The goal has been to delve deep into the experience of another world and bring that to each element of design. 
But do we consider these designs art or manufactured locations of consumerism? Artistic design is certainly used within theme parks. Painting, sculpture, and graphic design are heavily used in attractions in the overall environment. Decorative architecture is used in guest-facing structures, and costume design is used in the worker uniforms as well as show costumes. Within the ride experience itself, principles of theater are used to present the narrative, and ideas found in film composition are used to frame it. Rides also use common art techniques like Force Perspective, Trompe l'Oeil, and Pepper's Ghost. There is certainly an inherent visual aspect to theme parks that catch our attention. The lights and neon are used for advertisement and to indicate the shape and movement of a ride in the dark, but they also draw the eye. The moving components of carousels and spinners and the intricate structure of a roller coaster are necessary for the ride experience, but they're also interesting to look at. This is something both theme park proprietors and artists have noticed. There are several art pieces directly inspired by theme park visuals. Tiger and Turtle by Ulrich Gimp and Heike Mutter is a walking path shaped like a roller coaster, and you are able to walk the track, except for the vertical loop at the top. The title refers to the speed of a roller coaster, juxtaposed against the impasse created when the viewer is unable to walk the entire track. Artist E.J. Hill has repeatedly used roller coaster iconography in his installation and performance works. In a monumental offering of potential energy, he built a wooden roller coaster frame and lay down on a mattress in the middle of the track. It drew upon images of black trauma and the freeing reality of his leaving for home every day, not unlike the false danger of a good coaster. Then there was Dismaland a pop-up art exhibition conceived and curated by artist Banksy in 2015. It emerged out of a defunct swimming facility on the coast of England with the conceit of being a bemusement park. 59 artists, including Banksy, contributed artwork across multiple mediums, some using the setting as a prompt, but others focusing more on general themes of inequality and consumerism. Banksy even called attention to the performative mannerisms of most theme park employees by instructing the Dismaland staff to behave in the opposite, as surly and unhelpful, effectively becoming performance art. While there is another whole video's worth of dissection for Dismaland, and there probably will be, it is interesting to note how the artists use the cultural prevalence of theme parks to recontextualize an art exhibition, which suggests a relationship between art and theme parks that goes beyond the nominal. Sometime in the early 70s, historian and philosopher Umberto Eco took a road trip across America to discover our culture. What he found resonated with his ideas of simulacra and imitations, and he compiled his findings together in the 1973 essay Travels in Hyperreality. He went to Disneyland and Knott's Berry Farm, but he also went to the Johnson Presidential Library and the Madonna Inn. He looked for the culture that wasn't found in the MoMA or Carnegie Hall, but that of the common man. He tried to find the things that the everyday family sought out for artistic fulfillment, and he found a lot of theme parks. Or at least experiences that offered the same completely fabricated immersion of theme parks. And he noted the difference between the static tableau of a copy of a work of art and the immersive environment of a ghost town like Calico. Ghost towns involve a different approach from that of wax museums or museums for copies of works of art. In the first, nobody expects the wax Napoleon to be taken for real, but the hallucination serves to level the various historical periods and erase the distinction between historical reality and fantasy. In the case of the works of art, what is culturally, if not psychologically, hallucinatory is the confusion between copy and original, and the fetishization of art as a sequence of famous subjects. In the ghost town, on the contrary, since the theatricality is explicit, the hallucination operates in making the visitors take part in the scene, and thus become participants in that commercial fair that is apparently an element of the fiction, but in fact represents the substantial aim of the whole imitative machine. He also said that if America is the country of the Guggenheim Museum or the new skyscrapers of Manhattan, then Disneyland is a curious exception and American intellectuals are quite right to refuse to go there. But if America is what we have seen in the course of our trip, then Disneyland is at Sistine Chapel, and the hyper-realist of the art galleries are only the timid voyeurs of an immense and continuous found object. Echo did not entirely mean this positively, but that doesn't mean it can't be taken in a positive direction. 
Even rides can produce an art experience on their own. In the essay The Theme Park, The Art of Time and Space, Margaret J. King and J. G. O. Boyle stated, In the theme park, rides are mechanisms designed to position the visitor's point of view. Much as a camera lens is aligned, moving riders past a series of meticulously focused vignettes to advance the narrative. Rides also offer the opportunity to expand the experience with physical sensations appropriate to the narrative. The disorientation of flashing lights and smoke, the evocative smell of charcoal, the appropriate temperature changes, the rush of wind, and the confirmatory sensory input associated with floating or soaring. In Dan Olson's blog, Long Forgotten, dedicated to tracing back the ephemera of the Haunted Mansion to its roots, makes a case for the ride experience being an art experience by tracking the set dressing of the mansion through each of its three acts, from frightening unseen ghosts trapped within a pristine environment, to the intervention of Madame Leota in making a connection, to the mansion becoming decrepit upon the release of all the ghosts, who weren't that scary after all, just here to have a good time. I quote, So what we have is a thought-provoking interplay and integration between 1. the simple task of showing a house falling into decay, and 2. presenting a three-act play about grim grinning ghosts finally able to come out and socialize. The final product is far richer and more intelligent than a haunted house ride requires. I don't think the Imagineers consciously and deliberately thought through this whole thing, but I do think they relied on their artistic instincts as to what felt right and what provided the most satisfactory haunted house experience possible. To that end, they drew upon ideas running through the general culture and gave them fresh expression in a highly original manner. Humans are fascinated and mystified by the relationship between body and spirit, and here we see yet another proof of that interest, presented in a manner lighthearted and entertaining, but not thoughtless. And there are so many art pieces that evoke a feeling of a theme park. While they may not borrow its aesthetics, they have similar methods in communicating their message. Works like With All My Love for the Tulips, I Pray Forever by Yaoi Kasama and Urban Light by Chris Burden are not just meant to be seen from the outside, but also experienced from the inside, explored, even investigated, as you bring your perspective inside the work. Works like Funky Bones by Atelier Van Leeshop and Cadillac Range by the Ant Farm Collective use whimsy as a draw, allowing viewers to interact with and even contribute to the piece. 348 West 22nd Street, 2011-2015, by Doho Sa, is a life-size recreation of his New York City apartment made of steel tubes and brightly colored translucent fabric, and it has the basic size and layout of a maze from Halloween Horror Nights. And it uses the same emphasis on exploration and our relationship to space, just without anyone jumping out with a chainsaw. Ernesto Neto's Navadenga is an installation piece with the structure not dissimilar to a bouncy castle that you can walk inside. It also has pockets of scented potpourri, evoking the scent cannons used so often in theme parks. Andy Goldsworthy works with natural elements around him to help us question our relationship to our landscape, and they kind of look like those monsters back in Bomarzo. There's even an entire genre of art called Envisionary Environment, which takes installation art a step further and seeks to immerse the viewer in the artist's perspective, like a theme park. So what does all this mean? How does the world change if we start seeing theme parks as a form of art? And here's where I stop trying to sound like Sarah Green and start explaining my ulterior motives for this entire series. In 2019, the Louvre, ranked the world's most popular art museum, pulled in approximately 9.6 million visitors. The most popular theme park, the Magic Kingdom at the Walt Disney World Resort in Orlando, Florida, pulled in roughly 20.9 million. If theme parks are considered art, it's art that's much more enticing and available to the average vacationer statistically. How can art museums learn from theme parks? How can theme parks learn from art museums? If theme parks are art, what stewardship is required of theme park designers to preserve the history and message of the original park? Or is it their duty of care to innovate and push the artistic boundaries of theme parks forward? Is there a way to do both in one park? At what point is historic preservation a concern in a theme park? Would scrubbing a ride of outdated and offensive elements be considered artistic restoration or a creative remix of the original? How do we create rides and experiences under the idea of making art? What types of rides could be invented to make a more artistic experience? Could we make theme park experiences to have complex, cerebral themes like we expect from more traditional art? If theme parks are art, it is the most exclusive art form in current culture. 
Most of the stories told through theme parks are by old white men. How can we diversify creative voices in the theme park industry? How can we widen the sources of those narratives, as well as the perspectives of those charged with interpreting them? How do we break the current creative and monetary monopolies in theme parks today? Is it possible to separate theme parks from capitalism? Are they a public good, like a sculpture garden or a city park? How do we see workers in theme parks once we think of them more as docents or even participants in a form of performance art? Does that change how we treat them and the contributions of their labor? What do theme parks mean to the community around them? How do they fit into the culture of their region? What would it mean for local communities to take ownership of their small theme parks and make them unique arc pieces by and for the people in that area? Could there be a diverse cluster of small theme parks the same way many cities have their own art museums? How do we make theme parks and ride experiences accessible to everyone? How do we make these art pieces more available to the disabled community, the neuroatypical community? What barriers are keeping the marginalized in our population from experiencing the art of theme parks? If theme parks are art pieces, how do we protect these art pieces from climate change? What experiences will have to be altered in consideration for the environment? How will we innovate to make theme parks more sustainable? I don't expect all these to be answered the moment we rank Knott's Berry Farm as culturally significant as Hopper's Nighthawks, but once that through line's open, these questions have a chance to spark something generative. There is a grace we extend to Lion Decker illustrations and Scorsese films and Shaker furniture that we don't often see in themed entertainment. This allowance that these inherent products are also pieces of art. And I want that recognition for theme parks. There's something special in getting to explore this hyper-real space. And not only are you allowed to find meaning in it, you're allowed to have fun, too. We're given freedom to play and seek out our own narrative from the environment. It allows us to spend some time within another perspective without feeling intimidated by it. And it helps us to process the inherent artistic qualities of our real world, too. It helps connect our physiological thrills with themes and stories and expand how we feel in that space around us. So when it's safe to be out and around people again, go ahead and go to your favorite theme park. Or better yet, look for small local places that might house some hidden gems or generate hometown pride. Either way, don't be afraid to enter these parks with the mindset of experiencing art. You might be surprised by what you find. Thank you everyone for watching the video. This was my quarantine script and I am very happy to finally have it done. If you enjoy this format, I cannot recommend the channel The Art Assignment and its Case 4 series enough. It was the main inspiration for this video and I hope I could do it justice. If you enjoyed, consider liking, subscribing, and ringing the bell to get notified. Tell me what piece of fine art you'd love to see adapted into a theme park experience in the comments. And if you really liked the video, I do have a copy and a Patreon linked below that will definitely help with upkeep so I have time and emotional bandwidth to work on videos like these. For my patrons and subscribers, the next Tiki Room video is still in progress. I just figured out how to adapt the script so I don't have to wait until the parks reopen. Thank you so much again, and y'all stay safe out there. <laughs>